I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2014 uh, SU Research Day and Innovation Showcase. I'm Clifton Griffin, Dean of Grad Studies and Research. First and foremost, thank all of you for being here. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank our Provost, Dr. Allen, sitting back here for her support for this event and for research and scholarship overall. This day is about creating connections. Uh, those connections are important, whether it's faculty member to faculty member right here on campus um, or it's creating connections between our campus and the outside community. That's what we hope will be the takeaway message from your presentations today. As you can tell from the program, we have a wide array of topics. It's going to be fascinating. Um, I can't wait. I've already had a little bit of a snippet of almost all of the presentations and I can tell you, you will be wild. Uh, also awesome to see some of last year's presenters who are here supporting folks from this year. They're sweating a little bit less than some of them were this time last year, but uh, we're going to certainly appreciate their participation and their being here. So without further ado, I uh, want to introduce our first speaker. First speaker is Dr. Frank Shipper. He's going to be talking to us today about promoting economic fairness vis-a-vis -vis shared entrepreneurship around the world. Frank. Thank you. Well, you've got the topic, but let me just say before I move off the topic here. If you look around the world, internationally, nationally, locally, what you're finding is a lot of economic unfairness. But what we, my colleagues and I have been doing is studying employee-owned companies of one type or another around the world. We've had the pleasure of going to places like Spain and San Diego and, and La Jolla, but other places in, in between. And doing that, what we found is this idea of employee ownership, which we've renamed shared entrepreneurship because it isn't the document, it isn't the legal terminology, which is what shared ownership is, uh, describes. It's much greater than that. And I'm gonna ask for your help. Those of you who have already been here, I've already taken a guess of the number of marbles in that jar. So <clears throat> we can see that shared ownership can help to narrow that gap between the rich and the poor. What we have here is a quadruple convergence. Economic inequalities, educational inequities, economic constraints, and violence. If you look at those four items up there, you'll find a very high correlation. And if you look at what's happening in the Far East right now in Hong Kong, if you look what's happening in the Middle East, which happens in Ferguson, Missouri, you can see these things happening today, the intercorrelation between these four items. Here's the jar. Now, what I'm using this jar to do is to show you and demonstrate to you one of the principles of shared ownership, <clears throat> shared entrepreneurship, and that is shared collaboration. We're going to depend on the wisdom of the crowd here I was hoping we'd have 100 or more because the larger the sample size, the better this will work. But that we're gonna use you and help you demonstrate that you're a supercomputer collectively. Here's some of the amazing things if you look at economic inequalities around the world. 35% of the world population lives on less than $2 a day. If you take the top seven Wealthiest people in the United States, well, excuse me, wealthiest people in the world, if you take the top seven, each one of those people has more wealth than the 400 million poorest in the world. Hmm. That's one of those gee whiz statistics that I picked up during my research. This brings it to the United States. In the last 39 years, what has happened is the gap between the lowest 30% and the top 5%. We don't even talk about the top 1% because it gets ridiculous at that level. The gap between the bottom 30% and the top 5% has grown. It's more than doubled in the median household income. It's gone from a factor of 10 to a factor of 20. Now here are a number of economic statistics, sociometric statistics. And when you start looking at them, there's two that pop out to you. 
One is the educational attainment. Now, what you'll see is that really distinguishes between the haves and have-nots, to use Alinsky's words, if you're familiar with his work. The bottom 30%, of the bottom 30%, only 20% have a college degree. That tells you a great deal about the ability to be successful at this point in time. If you look at the second highlighted area, that's the SAT scores of the children of those groups, socioeconomic groups. The 897 for the lowest one is probably in an overestimate because not too many of those students actually take the SAT. What it does, it does, it does predict the future. It predicts that in the future, most likely, these people will be shut out of participating meaningfully in education, meaningfully in the environment, meaningfully in the economy. Bring it down to Maryland. In Maryland, when we look at Maryland, you can predict the average income per county if you know the education. In fact, the correlation here is over 0.7. It's a practically unheard of socioeconomic association. But in the state of Maryland, it's 0.7 between the average income and the average education level by county. Now, let's get to some good news. Two weeks from now, I'm going to be at the Ford Foundation. The Ford Foundation has started a number of initiatives. These are their six initiatives that they have started. They are trying to tackle this problem worldwide. We're at Salisbury University at Purdue School of Business and the 10 cohorts of mine that have been studying this issue in the management area. Where we come in is now number six, and that is promoting next generation work strategies. And that's where shared entrepreneurship comes in, shared ownership comes in. Now, let's define what we're talking about. You can look at it as a three-step approach. One, you have to encourage people to share their ideas. Why do we need to share our ideas? Because it's brains and not bronze worldwide that are making a difference. Number two, then you have to support those people with those ideas. And number three, you have to reward them. They have to be part of the reward process. And that's where co-ops, ESOPs, and other forms of employee-owned companies come to, to the forefront. This is our model, and you'll see another word in there that I haven't mentioned yet, freedom. The freedom has to exist for all three of these things to work in harmony. If they don't work in harmony, we don't succeed. We've got to work in harmony with all three of these concepts. When you look at the Ford initiatives and you look at what are the results according to the literature and according to our research, what are the results that we're getting already today, you'll see that people who belong to ESOPs and co-ops get a larger retirement nest egg than the average person. Give you one example. If you'd worked on the, on the floor of SRC Corporation out in Springfield, Missouri, and you'd been there for 25 years, which is about as long as the company has existed, you would have $400,000 in your ESOP plan. That's your retirement nest egg. There's another way of looking th at this. If you take those outcomes and divide them up, you'll see that you get, you get very positive outcomes that are profit-oriented so the business community can buy into it, and we've got to sell it to the business community. We get very positive outcomes from people. We can sell it to the unions. As you may know, United Steel Workers are working on this model at this time in conjunction with Montragon, which is the world's largest co-op out of Spain. And fortunately, and very fortunately, we've had a chance to visit with the Montragon people in Spain. The other thing is the planet benefits. Almost every one of these companies, one being Herman Miller a Furniture Company, does things that are sustainable for the environment. And they were doing things that were sustainable for the environment well before, well before anybody was talking about green, green marketing green and all these other issues. But they, they were way ahead of their time. Progressive, 
progressiveness leads to more progressiveness. And that's what we're finding. <clears throat> now, there's three ways to promote economic fairness vis-a-vis -vis shared entrepreneurship. One is through domestic growth. What you'll see up here is you see SRC, and SRC has 26 businesses they've grown from. In 25 years, they've grown 26 businesses. They've had a tremendous impact. Second one, you'll see Montregon. They have 250 co-ops in the Basque area of Spain. Ziggerman's community is in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and they have seven businesses they've grown to. NBC Ventures is up in Baltimore, Maryland, and they've grown into two different businesses, and that's all happened since we've been studying them. Okay, why do these things work? First of all, we have to get away from the traditional hierarchical way of thinking, because when you expand a hierarchy, what do you do? You grow the top of the pyramid. When you expand a shared entrepreneur firm, it grows concentrically. You have lower overhead expenses, you have people closer to the customers, closer to their products, and closer to each other. You can really look at these shared entrepreneurship family, uh, companies as extended families. W.L. Gore, which is located up in Newark, Delaware, what you find with them is they've expanded internationally. And the way they ex expand is by wholly owned subsidiaries in other countries. But the important thing is they take their values, they take their operating processes to wherever they move to, including China. Another company is a fair trade company. In fact, it's the largest exclusively fair trade company in the United States called Equal Exchange. It's located up in Massachusetts. They expand through an incubation pro process. When they go out, they set up co-ops in other parts of the world. They provide mentorship, they provide training, and they will even provide loans because most of these people need loans in order to get started. They need to buy seed, fertilizer, and other things. Primarily, they're growing coffee, coca, uh, co chocolate, and uh, bananas today. Tea also, forgot that one. All right, let me show you some of the, the success that's happened. One place up here is Bologna, Italy. Another one is Kaputska, that's Basque, so nobody knows if I mispronounce that word. <laughs> it's also called Montregon. If you look at these two regions, these are highly intense regions for cooperative movements outside the United States. And if you look at the data up there, you find that these two regions, one in Italy, one in Spain, and this is remarkable in Spain, have income comparable to the average per capita income in the United States, the average per capita income in the Netherlands. We have our own hotbed of ESOP companies, and it's the San Jose Valley, Silicon Valley. And what you find there is High education level, same thing you found in the other areas. You find low unemployment rates compared to the local area, and you find high earning power. You find very high earning power. The one thing I forgot to say that I want to make a big point of, wherever we've been and we've seen these things working, what we find is there's a very strong university. There's a very, very strong university. And the other thing, I wish Steve Adams was here, but Steve could tell you, Stanford was not a strong university post-World War II. Stanford University grew because of their provost. And the provost stayed there for approximately 40 years and made it into a strong university. Okay. Here's where we come into the picture. We have been writing case studies and recently a book that's been in press for a grand total of two months, okay? And what we have found is there's a huge need for this type of information out there. There's, in the last five years, there's over one million imprints of our cases. Okay, everybody goes, wow, 
and not you should, because uh, we get that all over. Wherever we go, we get that type of thing. The other thing is, we have found in the last two and a half years that I've been able to track it, that there's interest in what we're doing here from 140 different countries. There's only about 173 total in the, in the world, and we're getting interest from 140 some countries. We found that through help that 700 universities within the United States are looking at our, our material, and 70% 70 of them are the top undergraduate business schools, and 30% of them are the top graduate business schools. So that's where we're do what we're doing. We're trying to get people to see what we call next generation workforce strategies. And I think we're being fairly successful at doing that. Now, we're ready to get to the, to the answer. What's the, what's the mean? Here's the actual answer. The mean is 707. 711. 711. Okay. What's the closest? 520. Okay. This is the danger of doing this experiment with small sample sizes. Oftentimes, when I do this experiment, the person that's closest, the person that's closest, uh, actually is closer than the mean. Uh, uh, excuse me. The mean is actually closer than the closest person. This is, if you've ever read the book, The Wisdom of the Crowds, this comes out of that book. And <clears throat> I've done it in my classes, and most of the times it works out a lot better. <laughs> okay. Uh, and who had the closest guess? Who was it? Okay, come on down later, and I'll give you a prize. And we'll get on to the Q&A now. If you look at the, the, <clears throat> the symbol up there, it's hands around the world we're talking about. It's hands around the world. And we're talking about we need leadership. We need to empower people, freedom. We need profits, obviously. And we need ownership. We need to distribute ownership. But this is not a redistribution of income program. This is giving people the opportunity become, to meaningfully participate in the lifeblood of the economy. But you need all these ingredients to make it successful. Thank you. What, what happens is the pie grows larger. The pie grows larger. The other thing that happens is the kind of leadership that we're talking about are people who are more servant leaders, more selfless, selfless leaders. Um, <clears throat> what we find is like interviewing Jack Stack at Springfield, Missouri, he makes it very clear, when's enough enough? And you've got to have that kind of leadership. You can't have the leaders who you know, as well, I've forgotten, one of the multi-billionaires said, it's a way of keeping score. Well, let's watch the Orioles game instead. Oh, this idea has been around a while. Why do, why do you think there are more of these companies in the world? Because, our, well, if you look at the management textbooks, we don't teach that in management. We did a presentation at the Academy of Management two years ago, this coming year. And we've surveyed management textbooks and we don't teach it. There's a fellow by the name of Gary Hamill. It's the London School of Business. And what Gary Hamill says is this. Basically, what we're teaching in our textbooks is 19th century business. And we need to come up to the 21st century. Yeah. With, within the, the company, I wish I had Terry Kelly, who's the president and CEO, and happens to be female. It's, 
which is sort of remarkable because it's a big engineering company, but it's, she's, a, she's a female chemical engineering, and she's president of the company. She would tell you that she uh, had one of the Chinese managers speak up in a meeting to her saying something to her, and I won't try to repeat the exact words, and all the other Chinese managers were sort of shrinking back because they were afraid that speaking up was, you know, maybe we talk about it, but we really don't do it. And Terry said, he tells the story over and over because that's exactly what they want to have happen, and they are having it happen within their company. You know, we've got to start small. This is a grassroots movement to a large extent. It's a very much a grassroots movement. And, it's, and then if we can make some difference in some places in China, so much the better. All right. I got one more question. Or All right. We got, Idea. How many companies in the U.S. are known to follow? Yeah, about 10 percent of our economy. About, I think it's about 8,000 companies. Uh, it's six to 8,000 companies. Don't quote me exactly on that figures. That's why I'm giving you a range. Uh, and there's, and not all of them are totally shifted towards the shared entrepreneurship, but there are about six to 8,000 ESOP type companies. That does not include co-ops. There's maybe about 1,000 co-ops. Now I'm talking about worker co-ops, not sales co-ops. Southern States is a, is a customer co-op, not a worker co-op. There's a difference. I'm curious, is, are there any federal or state policies that can help promote this? There, there are both federal and state policies that help, and there are both federal and state policies that hurt and more at the federal level than at the state level. But a lot of states are getting on board. For example, Ohio is one of the states that it's got on board. They have their own Center for Employee Ownership in Ohio, and it's at Kent State. So, sort of could have been like Salisbury. Yeah, I plug us all the time. Okay, any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.